Hey, thanks so much for checking out our sermons online. I wanted to make you aware of a cool opportunity we have. We've launched an online campus. Our online campus is full interactive services where you can experience worship, listen to the message, and interact with a campus pastor. Our online campus meets every Thursday at 6 p.m. and Sundays at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Central Time. Join us at crossbridge.online. We'd love to see you there. Welcome to Crossbridge Community Church. No matter where you're listening from, any of our campuses, we are glad that you are here today. Uh, my hope and my prayer is that as you listen to the message today, that you would uh, connect with something and that God could speak to you and you could know who Jesus is and live for him more as a result. Uh, my name is Galen. I'm the youth pastor for the church. I absolutely love being the youth pastor for this church. Uh, we're doing all kinds of fun, and exciting, unique, different things uh, to uh, have students enter into a growing relationship with Jesus, and I love serving as the youth pastor here. I actually want to take just a moment and highlight next week uh, on August 12th, Sunday night, is our Paint Wars. It's one of our biggest events of the year. Uh, it's our fall kickoff party that we do every year. Now, if you're not familiar with Paint Wars, uh, we take students. Uh, we had over 100 students last year. We meet at the Ottawa campus. Uh, we come into the worship center. We tell them clearly, this is who Jesus is. This is what he's done for you. This is how you can have new life and follow him in a relationship with him. And then we all head out to the field and we have a bunch of different games where we can fling, throw, toss, smash, paint into one another. Uh, and it's an amazing, fun night. Now, we do it specifically to invite people that are not already a part of our youth ministry so they can come and hear about Jesus. Uh, so if you have a student 7th through 12th grade, any campus, August 12th, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Ottawa campus. If you don't have a student, share it on our Facebook and tell someone as well. Uh, it's going to be a great night. My shameless plug for youth ministry is done. Um, anytime you give the youth pastor the microphone, I'm going to talk about youth ministry a little bit. So... We're really looking forward to it. I'm actually really excited today, though, to continue on in our uh, series in Ephesians. Uh, we've been looking at Paul's letter to Ephesus where he's outlining this is who we are. This is who God says we are, and this is our identity. But now then, because of that, this is how we actually live. And now we're in the back half of the book where it's getting really, really practical, and this is how we should live. Last week, we talked about wives uh, and husbands and submitting to one another. How do we live in marriage? The next section is children and parents. How do you live one another and obey and respect one another? And then today's passage from Ephesians 6. Let me read this to you. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all of your heart. Work with enthusiasm as if you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good that we do, whether we're slaves or free. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to look at your word in these scriptures. God, I pray that you would speak to us. Uh, and God, I pray that you would help us to become better workers simply because we follow after you. God, give us your heart of love and compassion and grace. We love you, Jesus. Pray this in your name. Amen. I think this might be a strange passage to hear, masters and slaves, uh, even in our society and context of today. Yet I love this passage because I think it speaks to us so much of how we should work for other people. And it's a reminder that we don't just have a relationship with God where we walk around, yes, I'm good with God. I might go to church sometimes. I pray. Me and him, we're good. No, but if we have a relationship with God, it infects every area of our life, and it changes our relationships with everybody, including our workplace. And so I think uh, it's an amazing passage for us to check out and jump into a little bit more. Uh, and before we do, I also want to say this. I believe that everyone has a job. Whether you get a paycheck from a place, that would obviously be your job, or if you're a stay-at-home parent, your job's incredibly important. Or even if you're retired, I would say you have a job. What is your purpose? What are you pursuing? What are you working for? What are you investing in? What are you trying to make better? Whatever that is, I think that is your job and everybody has a job. And even more so, I would say this, what you do matters. No matter what you do, what you do matters because people are involved and people are incredibly important to God. What you do matters matters. You could work in construction, I'd say your job matters. You could work with the poor, your job matters. You could flip burgers, your job matters. If you work for the DMV, eh? no, your job matters too. You may not love the work environment, but your job matters too. And here's why. Anytime we're working with people, 
It's incredibly, incredibly important because God cares how we relate to people and if we love people or not uh, and how we work alongside them, with them, and for them. So no matter what you do, your job matters. It's, it's more important not what you do, but actually how you do it. So Paul gives us some advice. Uh, and let me just take a general poll real fast, a little crowd participation. Uh, if you're in Peru, you go ahead and raise your hand too online. You can chat in the box if you want. But do you like your boss? Would you just raise your hand? Raise your hand if you like your boss, yeah? Uh, we'll get a little honest. We'll see how honest you could be here. Um, tell me, or by show of hands, would you prefer your boss to be someone different? Any, any honest people, would you prefer, don't look around the room at each other, especially if you work together. Would you prefer them to be someone different? Here's the thing. Oftentimes we don't get to pick the people that we work for or the people that we work with. Sometimes they have weird, annoying habits, things that kind of get under our skin, but we still need to learn how to love them. You know, I actually like my boss, Pastor Kevin, um, despite uh, some of his weird quirks. And I have a list of these quirks, but I'll just share one of them with you today. Uh, and that is, he's got a weird obsession with cleanliness. Like, it, it's, it's interesting. If you look, here's a test for you. Next time you see him, look at his glasses. I guarantee you there's not a spot on them. They are perfectly clean. Anything with a glass surface. I've caught him before cleaning my laptop, cleaning my iPad, just because it has to be clean. And you may not know this about me, but I'm actually not a very clean person, and I'm totally okay with that. I'm fine with that. But there's been times where I've been sitting in staff meeting next to Kevin, and I'm actually paying attention and listening, and Kevin will pull out his glasses cleaner. He'll see if I'm looking or not. He'll reach over and go, clean my phone real fast, and try to hide it from me. And I'm like, Kevin, why'd you just clean my phone? Like, yes, it was dirty, had thumbprints on it because I actually use it. And guess what? My thumbs are gonna go right back on it. It's gonna be dirty, it's okay. But Kevin has to clean everything. It's weird and it's different. And in the same way, I'd say this, you probably work with people that have little habits that might annoy you or people that uh, just rub you the wrong way. So how can we actually learn to love these people? And does our relationship with Jesus have anything to do with these people? So Paul jumps in and says this, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, whether they are watching you or not. Serve people as if you would serve Jesus. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus was your boss, would it change the way that you work at all? And I'm not saying, like, don't look at your boss in a bad way right now. Would it change you at all? If Jesus was your boss, how would it change how you would work? You know, it was interesting. I was looking. There's a national uh, study that I was reading this week. The average nine-to-five worker wastes two hours every single day. Two hours of the nine-to-five shift. If Jesus was our boss, do you think we could get away with that? If Jesus was your boss, would you not say things that you do say now? Would you not do things or do things that you're maybe not doing now? Would it change how you worked if you served people as if they were Jesus? Now, some of you would be like, no, it'd be awesome if Jesus was my boss. Man, I work at Subway, and the line is super long. The line's out the door. I'm like, hey, boss man, Jesus, come in here. Uh, these people are hungry. Here's two loaves of bread and some fishes. How about you just multiply it and make sandwiches for everybody? Boom, done. I don't have to do a thing. It'd be awesome to have Jesus as my boss. If you said that, first of all, I would tell you fishes is not a word. You need to work on your grammar. Second of all, Jesus still isn't your boss, so we need to learn from Paul and how to do this, okay? How do we actually love people that it's hard to work with? And I love this verse, and check this out. Ephesians 6, 7, he says this next. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good that we do. It's the Lord that rewards us. Your boss can give you a bonus, but ultimately we work for God in heaven who can give us a reward that is eternal. And the reason I like this verse so much is I feel like Paul is calling us to remember our identity. He says, don't get so worked up at your job. Remember who you are. If you can remember who you are and what you're ultimately doing, working for the God who can reward you instead of just your boss, you don't have to be shaken when you have a bad day at work. You don't have to be uh, messed up inside when the boss yells at you. You don't have to get so frustrated and angry or go off the handle and yell at someone. He says, remember who you are. And you go back to the foundation he's laid in chapters one through three in Ephesians. And he says, this is your identity. And your identity is not found in what you do, your identity is found in whose you are and who you belong to. He said, you are blessed by God. You are loved by God. You are chosen by God. You are viewed without fault. You are forgiven. You have been adopted into his family and you are showered in God's kindness and grace. This is who you are. 
So whether you've been yelled at, whether you've been fired, whether you've been forced to retire, you don't have to ask yourself, what, what is my purpose? Who am I? Because God says, you are my child and I love you. And it's important to remember that our identity does not come from where we work or what we do, but it comes from who God says we are. And it's this identity that Paul then continues and he says, now you need to live out of it. He says, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. And he says this, I love this. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So three things, make the most of every opportunity. Don't live thoughtlessly, understand what God wants you to do. You know, in my own life, sometimes I can be pretty thoughtless, do things without thinking. You just kind of go through the motions, whatever, I need to do it, I'm going to get it done, and you do things without thinking. You know, at our house, actually this happened this last week, on Tuesday night, uh, we had just put the baby to bed, she was asleep. In our house, there's two rules when the baby's sleeping. Number one, don't yell, because if the baby wakes up, you get yelled at. Number two, never leave outside the front door. The baby's room's right next to the front door. If you open the front door, she wakes up every single time. So don't, don't leave out the front door. And you know, I would also say this. I believe there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those people in the world that uh, bless you. You're, you're like me and we're in this together. You're okay with a little bit of mess in your life. If you want to sit down and rest and relax, you can sit down on the couch. There might be some shoes on the ground or some clothes to pick up. But you know, that just seems like more work to pick it up. So I'm going to rest and sit there. There's a second group of people in the world that say, no, to actually rest, I need to clean everything up first. So when I sit, I can look at my beautiful, clean house and then I can rest. My wife and I are very different in this. She is that second group of people. So Tuesday night, we were, we were both tired. We had people at the house all weekend. We sit down to rest and I'm like, ah, but she starts cleaning everything up. I was like, what are you doing? And then I start to feel guilty. Have you ever been there? Uh, where it's like, oh man, you're cleaning up. I should probably help, but I don't really want to. I start to feel a little guilty. But she's picking everything up and finally I'm like, okay, I'll help you, I'll help you. And I look up and there's uh, the American flag is in our living room uh, hanging up against the wall. And she'd asked me to put it outside, put it back in its place. Okay, I'll help. Thoughtlessly, without thinking, I grab the flag, head straight out the front door, walk around, and I begin to put the flag in its place. As I'm doing this, you know, I'm working on it, trying to screw it in there or whatever. I hear this on the window. So I turn and I look at the window and my, my uh, wife is mouthing the words, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm putting up the flag. Look, it's beautiful. It's awesome. You asked me to do it. I did it. We love each other. We love love. This is great. Awesome. And she looks at me and she goes, that door. And I go, oh no, the door, the baby, I'm in trouble. This is not going to be good. I was acting thoughtlessly. I never even thought about what I was doing. I just knew that I had to take care of the flag. I was going to get it done, and I didn't think about anything else. I think it's interesting that Paul writes, don't live thoughtlessly, when he's talking about our work, because I think Paul knows our temptation to say, oh, it's another Monday. Time to get up, punch in, punch out, uh, do my day, another week, another day, another month. We'll just go to work, get the paycheck, get it done, and live in our work thoughtlessly. What can I do to get to the weekend? Instead, he says, no, 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 actually be thoughtful about your work. Be intentional with your work and make the most of every opportunity when they come up and know what God wants you to do in your work. And what is it that God wants us to do? He wants us to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus everywhere we go. So we need to be actually intentional and thoughtful about this. And Paul goes on to say, yes, we are, we are called to obey our bosses. We're also called to work hard for them. We're called to not only like, but to love the people that we work for and the people that we work with and the people that we serve. But Paul gets right down to the core and he says, no, it's actually even more than that. You were called to lay down your rights and your life for those people that you work with and the people that you work for. You know, it's interesting, every time Paul talks about relationships, no matter what the context is, he points us back to Jesus. In Ephesians, he does this chapter five right at the beginning. He says, imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, because you are his children, live a life filled with love. And then he says, following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Very similarly in Philippians, he says the same thing starting in verse five. He says, in your relationships with one another, how you live and work with one another, have the same mindset or have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. So Jesus is God. He has all the power, the position, the authority, the privileges. So what does he do with it? 
It says, he gave up his divine privileges. He took on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. So Jesus, with all the power, gives up his rights, humbles himself, takes on the role of a servant and a slave, washes our feet, and it eventually becomes obedient even to death. And this is where the awesome poem takes a turn. It says, therefore, because he did this, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says, this is how you should live. Take whatever position, power, authority you have and ask yourself, how can I humble myself? How can I come under other people? How can I give up my life to love people? And either whether it's this side of heaven or not, eventually God will raise you up because you've humbled yourself with with the help of his spirit to love other people. And why does Jesus go through this process? He does it to show his love for people so that they can enter a relationship with God. So Paul says, live like this. Give up your life just like Jesus. Why? So that we can love people and they can have a relationship with God as well. This is what we are called to do. And here's why we're supposed to do it. This is where it gets real. Think about this. Think about your boss or your coworkers, the people you work with or the people that you serve. Chances are, if they're not coming to church right now, you might be the only little glimpse of Jesus that they ever see. You might be the only person that would go out of their way to show them love and and share with them God's love. They may never see it if it's not for you. And some of you are like, wow, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of pressure. Like, I'm not sure I can do that. Truth be told, I would tell you, I don't think you can do this on your own. But here's what I know. If you follow Jesus and you say, God, help me to love the people that I work with or the people that I work for. God's spirit, he lives within us is what the Bible says. And he begins to point things out to us. I believe that God will begin to open our eyes to opportunities to love the people that we work with or serve. And as he points those things out, hey, maybe you could do this for that person. Then Paul says, make the most of those opportunities. Live with intentionality. Actually go after those people and go over the top in loving them. And as you do, love people so radically that they might begin to question, why are you doing this for me? I would actually say, get noticed for the ways that you love and notice others and care for other people. That's how we should be noticed. And if so, they'll say, why? You say, listen, God has loved me so much. I simply just want to love you too. And we can love other people with the love of God. I think of it this way. One of our students uh, just came back from teen camp this last week. Uh, We had an amazing time at teen camp. Uh, We got back and she said, listen, I've always uh, lived for Jesus, have a relationship with him, come to church, I pray, read my Bible. But one thing that God talked to me about at camp was I'm not that good all the time at actually loving people. And so I I want God to help me to love people. So in her work, she works at Culver's uh, right down the road. Uh, One day after saying this, after praying this, she was working and one of her coworkers, it was pretty obvious she was having a, a rough day. So she noticed this opportunity. She lives with intentionality. So she goes up to her and says, hey, what's going on with you? I want to let you know that I'm here for you. I'll talk with you. Uh, I'll listen to you and I want to be praying for you. So if you want to share what's going on in your life, like I'd love to just be here for you and pray for you. And that was the open door that in the context of that relationship, that friend uh, began to open up and here's what's going on in my life. And I believe in that moment, our our student was showing the love of God to that person. It doesn't always have to be huge, big, extravagant ways, even though I think God wants us to do that too. But it could be as simple as noticing, talking, listening, praying, and simply being there and showing up for people and loving them. I think this is a lot of times what the love of God looks like. But I'd also say this, I think a lot of us view the church as this place that we come to uh, on the weekend or whatever time that we watch the service. This is, this is our church. Uh, and that while that's true, I would say this, this is, is a filling station. This is the Thornton's Shell BP for your soul. When you come to this place, you are reminded, just as Paul did, you're reminded this is what God has done for you. This is who he says you are. Now you need to live into this new identity. We receive instructions of how we should live and we're inspired to go out into the world and to live and to love people. But this can't be it. You don't go to a gas station, fill up with gas, and then just sit in your car. You fill up so that you actually go somewhere. And I think for us, the going somewhere is right back into our home with our family, right back into our workplace. And you are sent, uh, think of it this way, you are all missionaries for Jesus. 
may not be a missionary to another country, but if you follow Jesus, no matter where you go, you carry the mission of God with you, the mission to lead people into a relationship with Jesus. No matter where you go, you're carrying that mission. So could you go into your workplace having a missionary mindset of how can I love these people right where they are? I think of it this way. Um, when I was actually assigned this passage uh, to preach on, I knew immediately the first interaction I really had with this passage of scripture, um, I was about 20, 20 years old. I just began to follow Jesus seriously um, for the first time. I'd received a call to ministry. I knew God was calling me to be a pastor. So I was going to college for that at the time. Uh, but I was waiting tables at Chili's to help pay for school. And I was always on the bar side uh, of the restaurant. And I remember I had a terrible day at work. We were really slow. Nobody came came in, the people that did come in were rude, nasty, dirty, left things everywhere, and they didn't tip. And I was really upset about it, and I kind of stormed out of work early. And in doing so, I left behind my apron that had my book in it, where you like write down people's orders, you keep your cash for your bank that you give people change in. I left it. And I just thought, when I go into work tomorrow, it's going to be gone. The money I have in there, it's going to be gone. It's going to be terrible. Instead, I show up to work the next day, and my apron and my book is there. The money's still in it, and written right on the front of my book uh, is this verse, Ephesians 6, 7. Serve people with enthusiasm as if you were serving the Lord instead of people. And the bartender who was following Jesus as well, he had wrote that in my book. And I was like, yeah, this verse is like cool and great and woo, let's go love people. But like these people, I don't want to love these people. They're not even nice. But no, Jesus laid his da down his life even for his murderers and said, God, forgive them. So yeah, I know I should, I should serve God better and literally my job is serving waiting tables. I should love these people like Jesus. And that shift was actually pretty slow as well. And before the bartender came in, there was a trucker uh, that had stopped for an early dinner and he came up to the bar. Uh, and so he wanted uh, a tall beer. So I poured him his drink, sat down and started talking with him. Uh, but we were real, real slow, so we had a conversation and I just had my Bible sitting uh, right there as well. And I said, hey, uh, do you care? You know, go ahead and eat your meal. You care if I read some? He's like, no, go for it. So I'm reading. He's like, what are you reading? Is that the Bible? I was like, yeah. He's like, it's pretty funny, uh, you know, you're being a bartender reading the Bible. I was like, well, I, I like to read, you know, when we're slow. Anyway, we continue this relationship. This guy is four tall beers in. He tries to get my attention by waving at me and in doing so spills his beer all over my Bible, all over Paul and the Romans, everywhere. And as he does, he's like, oh, yelling expletives. And so I run over, I was like, what's wrong? He's like, oh, I spilled my beer all over your Bible. I'm definitely going to hell now. And I remember I was like, man, dude, pages will dry. It will be fine. But listen, you don't need to live in fear of judgment. God loves you. Now, I don't know who you are. I don't know your name. I don't know where you're coming from, driving your truck route. But I do know that God loves you. You can have a relationship with him and he can actually change your life. And there, four tall beers in, big burly trucker man with his beard. He's got tears rolling down his face. And I don't know his name. I don't know what happened to him after that. But for me, this is where this verse comes alive. Does it matter that I made no money again that night? Does it matter that I was unhappy with that job for the next few weeks? No, because it's not about what we do, it's about how we go about it. And people are important. So when we, we need to ask God to open our eyes to the opportunities we have with the people that we have and stop viewing our job as, well, it's Monday morning, I have to. And maybe start viewing our job as this is a strategic mission field. This is where God has placed me for this time and this place to love these people. Say, God, show me these opportunities. Help me to make the most of them. I'm gonna live with intentionality to lay down my life for these people. And God, as I do, help it to point others towards you so they can have a relationship with you as well. Today, I would ask you this. Uh, what does this mean for you? What's a practical step for you? Maybe step one is to pray for your boss. And some of you are like, oh, I pray for my boss. My boss needs Jesus. Okay, but actually pray for them. Make a checklist. How many times this week did you pray for your boss? And, and I would say this too, and not just your boss, the people you work with, the people that are under you, the people you serve. Because here's the thing, you begin to pray for people, it changes the way that you look at them. It changes the way that you view them. Uh, it changes everything about your relationship. Begin to pray for them. Maybe for you, it's picking one person to not be thoughtless about, but to be intentional. I'm gonna go out of my way to lay down my life to love you. Maybe for you, you already have a good relationship with someone. You actually need to just to simply invite them to come to church with you. Crazy statistic, uh, between... 75 and 90% of people that come to church for the first time come because of a personal invitation. And alongside that, 60% of people say that if someone would invite them to church, they would go. 
People want to come, they just need to be asked. Maybe for you, your bold step of loving them, simply to ask them to come experience the hope that we have in Jesus. Whatever it is for you this week, I want you to consider, how can you lay down your life and your relationships? How can you give up your position? How can you give up your authority to show people that God loves them? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the amazing example that you gave us. You gave up your life just so we could have a relationship with you. God, that you can change us and transform us and make our lives so much better because we're living life and love how you designed it to be. God, my hope and prayer is that this week you would continue to challenge us with this message. Open our eyes to the people that are hard to love, but open our eyes to the opportunities that we have to actually love them. God, give us the courage to say yes, whatever that looks like in the moment, to go above and beyond and the extra mile to show radical love to people. God, as we do, open their eyes to see you through us. Jesus, help us in our relationships. Help us with our love for one another. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.